If you want to hear about how every story from the original trilogy of Scary Stories books was used in the movie, then stick around to the end of this video. It is the fall of 1968 in a small town called Mill Valley, Pennsylvania, and Halloween is being celebrated in full force. One thing I noticed was a poster for the Halloween Horror Double Bill, which presumably was a reference to the double feature taking place at the drive-in, where we would later see the characters watch Night of the Living Dead. But the Double Bill might also be self-referential, because at the end of the movie we learn that the ending is left open for a possible sequel. That's not the only bit of foreshadowing early on. One of the main characters, Chuck, wants to be Spider-Man for Halloween, but his mom ends up making him a literal spider costume. His sister Ruth bickers with him because she sees him as a pest, pun intended, the first example of her distaste for arachnids. Shortly after, when they go to check out the haunted house, we see that the place is crawling with spiders, and at the end of that sequence, Tommy pushes Ruth into the locked room where she gets spider webs caught in her hair, which is likely where she first receives the bite that becomes infected with spider eggs, known as the red spot. But I'll discuss that further when we get to it. First, let's talk about the first supernatural sight, the old lady with the black Doberman seen by Chuck in the haunted house. This is likely part of the corrupt Bellows family that we learn more about throughout the movie, but the imagery of a black dog is one that comes up a couple times in Alvin Schwartz's trilogy of books, most notably the appropriately titled story, The Black Dog, from the third book. In that story, a man named Peter Rothberg lives alone in an old house. Every night at 11 p.m., honestly surprised it's not 3 a.m. for once, a mysterious black dog appears and runs down the stairs. He tries night after night to catch it, but it's unsuccessful, until one day his neighbor sets up downstairs with a pistol. The dog disappears, never to be seen again, but he can still hear the dog running on most nights. Like the dog in the story, this is the only time that Chuck gets a good look at the dog, and naturally, his friends don't believe him at first. Stella and Ramon happen across the room that Sarah Bellows was locked away in, and it's there that they discover two items, the music box and Sarah's book of scary stories. When they find the book, there are a number of stories already written inside, and they correspond to actual stories in the books that the movie is sourced from. The ones that I noticed included May I Carry Your Basket, a story about a man who offers help to an old woman out in the cold one night with her basket, only to discover that the basket contains her head, which attacks him. Somebody Fell From a Loft, the story of a mysterious corpse that falls onto a ship at sea, the ghost with the bloody fingers, the story of a bloody hand that haunts hotel guests, the hook, the story of an escaped convict with a hook for a hand, Strangers, a story about a man who meets a woman reading ghost stories on the train who proclaims that he doesn't believe in ghosts, only to see the woman vanish before him. The Attic, about a guy who steps on a nail in the attic. Cat's Paw, about a man who shoots the cat who's continually stealing meat from his smokehouse, only to discover that it was actually a shape-shifting witch who was also, plot twist, his neighbor's wife. And Wendigo, the story of a hunter who goes out on a trip with a Native American guy named DeFago, a name I'm sure he never got made fun of at all during middle school for, who essentially gets dragged away by this Algonquian mythological creature known as the Wendigo. Then there's a blank page, and on the page after that, Stella sees the beginnings of another story, Harold. She smears the red ink with her finger, as if to suggest that the words had just been written, and the ink, or as we later find blood, was fresh. In the movie, the jock character Tommy lives on a farm with his mother, and he and his friends continually abuse the scarecrow, Harold, by throwing bottles and hitting it with a bat, until one night, Harold comes to life and stabs Tommy with a pitchfork, causing him to turn into an ugly scarecrow. The involvement of the character Tommy is kind of hidden in plain sight in the movie, because the story in the book centers around two farmers, one of which is named Thomas. In the book, they create Harold to resemble a farmer that they don't like, and similarly abuse the scarecrow. But instead of turning Thomas into a scarecrow, Harold skins him and sets his skin out to dry in the sun. The next story to play out in the movie is The Big Toe. Unlike Harold, the name of the character in The Big Toe is never stated, but in the movie, the name August corresponds with one of Stella's two best friends, Augie. In the book, the boy finds the toe out in the garden, so his mom puts it into her soup, which is ridiculous. So in the movie, he just finds the stew, which appears in the fridge, and it contains the toe and other various body parts. The next story is The Red Spot, which is another one where the name of the character, Ruth, nicely corresponds with the name of the character from the original story. In the book, Ruth's boil bursts to release the spiders who had nested in her face while she's in the bath. But in the movie, she rushes to the school bathroom before her production of Bye Bye Birdie, which was likely chosen because it's about a rock star named Conrad Birdie who is to perform one last hit before being drafted into the army. Much like how the character Ramon's final act is helping rescue Stella before he's taken overseas by the draft. The kids try to rush to save Ruth from popping open the red spot, but accidentally run into the wrong bathroom where there are these four girls just standing there in the dark. Wait, what was going on in that first bathroom? But anyway, after that, 
that, they go to visit Lulu Baptiste, who has a matching music box to the one we previously saw in Sarah Bellows' room, but this time we get to hear it play. And the tune is a song known as the Hearst Song. You see, the Scary Stories books are not only filled with scary stories, but also games slash pranks to play at Halloween parties, or songs complete with lyrics and sheet music. I'm not a musician, but I was able to recognize the melody from the only lyrics that Lulu mentions, about the worms crawling, and the fact that there's an audiobook version where some old guy sings the song. Roll it. Don't you ever laugh as the hearse goes by, for you may be the next to die. They wrap you up in a big white sheet, from your head down to your feet. Oh no, this song is so scary. <laughs> but it's around this time that Chuck starts to mention that he's been having this recurring dream, which eventually leads to his own scary encounter, where this creature known as the Pale Lady corners him from every direction and eventually catches him and absorbs him. The book version is similar but with different circumstances. An artist named Lucy Morgan decides to go out of town to do some painting, but her destination changes after a Pale Lady in a dream tells her that this is an evil place. She ends up going to a town called Dorset, and when she goes to look at her room, it's the same one as the location from her dream. Just like how Chuck's dream had described the Red Room, which is a room in the hospital that the kids are looking for. Lucy ends up fleeing the town after seeing the Pale Lady from her dream, but Chuck isn't so lucky. The next one is one that I really did not expect to see in the movie adaptation, Me Tai Dodie Walker, a story from the original Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark book. The film version has our characters locked in a jail cell, where this character called the Gangly Man assembles itself after the dog at the police station watches its body parts fall down the chimney, and it goes after Ramon. The book kind of establishes the legend that Ramon and Stella encounter. It tells of a man who offers $200 to anyone who stays in this haunted house overnight. A boy decides to try it and goes there with his dog. He goes there and hears someone in the distance singing the lyrics, Me Tai Dodi Walker. And then his dog responds by singing, Lynchy Kinchy Kali Mali Dingo Dingo. If you listen to the dog's grunting in the film, it actually sounds like he's grunting these lyrics. The singing gets closer and closer until the head falls down the chimney, and in the book, that's where it ends. But the movie really takes it a step further by having it be the head of a creature that continues to come after Ramon. That would seemingly be the last one, but we eventually come to find that this entire thing was part of one big scary story, and that is The Haunted House. Here's the lowdown on The Haunted House. It's the tenth story in book number one, and it follows a preacher who goes to investigate a house said to have been haunted for the last ten years. The ghost of a woman appears and tells the preacher the story of how her husband killed her for her money and buried her in the cellar. She instructs the man to give her a proper burial and put her finger in the collection plate at church, where it will stick to the man who is guilty. After he's done this, she'll tell him where the money is hidden, and it's his to keep. This may not sound like anything from the movie, until you consider the fact that this is essentially the whole movie. These kids wander into a haunted house and come across the book from Sarah Bellows. Little by little, they learn more and more about how her family abused her and killed her for trying to expose the truth about how her family's paper mill poisoned the water supply and got some kids killed. She's bringing her killers to justice, just as the woman's ghost in the haunted house story did. And instead of publicly exposing the killer as seen in the book, she gets Stella, the girl who a few short days ago was too afraid to write for her school newspaper paper to write in the book and bring out the truth about Sarah's death. Even though I'm pretty sure it's been 70 years and nobody cares anymore. But still, this one small action somehow fixes everything. It's just like it was told in the beginning of the movie. Stories hurt, and stories heal. And we roll the credits, which are played over the graphics done in the same style as the original artwork from the book trilogy. So that's it, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark number one. I also recently did a video on the top five things you missed from its number one, so click that video on the left if you want to see that. And if you like horror, you're definitely going to want to subscribe to CZ's World because I upload new horrors every week. Ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next video, assuming we both survive.